Welcome to Pitch It To Me Podcast, a show about the subjective past, present, and potential future of flesh and blood design. Will our hosts get through an entire episode without mentioning Leviah? Stay tuned to find out. Today's episode will be about single class sets. On Red Pitch, Joel will talk about how single class sets can flesh out existing archetypes while creating new ones. On Yellow Pitch, Clark will contemplate which class should be next for a single class set. And on Blue Pitch, Fuzzy will discuss how bright lights and single class sets are experienced by new and enfranchised players. You can find us across all socials such as TikTok and Instagram at Pitch It To Me Podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is Clark. I'm Fuzzy. I'm Joel. And if you're unaware, this set only had one class. Wait, this is new information to me. (laughs) Believe it or not, Clark, we just played a bunch of pre-releases for Bright Lights. Uh Uh-huh. And Bright Lights Uh only had one class. Wait a minute. Hold on. No, wasn't there... Or that other... Shit, you're right. (laughs) (laughs) Oops, all mechanologist. Yeah. Uh, LSS and James White have said publicly that they plan on doing this again. They really enjoyed the process of like designing the set and it seems to be getting a pretty good reception. I think the expansion slot helped a lot with that. So it seems like uh, we're going to be getting some more single class sets in the future. And we wanted to take an episode to talk about those. Mm -hmm. Pitch to me podcast, always looking towards the future. We want to think about what's going to happen. Which classes might get the next ones? We are, are good. We are the past, present, and future. We do have one small announcement related to official podcast business. So get out your calendars, everybody. Just kidding. We're going to be... <laughs> Just, no, no, no. Get out your calendars. Mark this down. No, we're not giving you homework. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yes, we are. <laughs> we're moving from a Monday release schedule bleh, to a Tuesday release schedule. <laughs> Let's go. Because Tuesdays are a little bit easier for us, uh, believe it or not. Yeah, it's mostly just making sure that we have um, a, just a, an extra day of wiggle room to, to get the production stuff done. All right, so with that being said, let's go ahead and jump into our red pitch. Joel, what do you have for us? Yeah, for red pitch today, I wanted to talk about how these single class sets, similar to how Bright Light siloed the design with items, boost, and uh, evos, and see how they can apply this same framework for classes that need support in some way or to flesh out existing archetypes like we've seen very few snippets of, which I'll talk about later. Yeah, like in Dynasty, we had Hyperdriver support seen for the first time. Like Hyperdriver itself was all the way from Arcane Rising, but in Dynasty, we actually saw cards that cared about Hyperdrivers or give perks to your Hyperdrivers. And now in Bright Lights, we see it as a very fully fledged out, like, hero type. Max Driver's game plan is all about it. Yeah, because with Hyper Driver specifically, we saw it start out as a color locked item. And then we saw it in three colors. And now we see it as a token as well. So the evolution of that went from, you know, a random card that we probably didn't look too closely at. And then it turned into a completely new hero. And I look at things like, for instance axes and wonder the same thing like that has never really been explored outside of giving you weapons or giving a few buffs but never in the full range that we've just seen bright lights do for mechanologist yeah it's those like really tiny little niche or design spaces where you you put your keyword into the card lookup and then you get like six cards and you're like wow these are six really interesting cards I wish I could run them in a deck. (laughs) It'd be fun to. It'd be interesting. Yeah, and they do something interesting with the round the table, if I can jump forward a little bit. They introduced more Crouching Tiger support for Ninja Mm -hmm. in a way where Crouching Tiger has only ever been in supplemental sets, if I'm not mistaken. Especially the equipment, right? Mm -hmm. Like, if I'm running a Crouching Tiger Ninja, I really want a lot of the equipments that they were able to post. Yeah, so in the future, we could possibly see the new Axe Warrior. Look, we haven't really seen any new art for any new hero just yet because it's only been random support thrown in in different supplemental sets. So I'm wondering if single class sets will be the way that this archetype gets expanded on, if at all. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Also, I look at aim counters and feel that feel as if that is an unexplored space as well. There's again, only a few cards that were printed and again, an outsiders, but still feels like it needs a lot of work to be a deck specifically centered around aim counters. Yeah. Our buddy Talon has been, he constantly keeps trying to make aim counters Mm -hmm. with Riptide a thing. He's always trying to make it work. And he's every single time it's like, no, nah, this deck is just a little not it's not there yet. It's not there yet. Mm. It's just consistently not there yet. Yeah, I think they've both aim counters and crouching tiger and axes all have been brought up in several different sets already. And still it feels like they still have less support than the original intent of the class, like warriors with swords or rangers with just generically good arrows. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because these these classes all feel like they're only three to six cards away from being a full deck. Even if it's just if you run a, like an aim counter deck, you're forced to run these specific sixty cards because forty of them deal with aim counters. Mm-hmm. Even something like that would I feel like would open up the the way that we approach these different classes. Because right now I feel like with warrior they're so incredibly siloed. Like even branching out to axes, you're throwing away so much of the buffs or the cards that already synergize with weapons as it stands. So I'd like to see how single class sets are a way to approach different pro- play styles like this and, you know, help with the longevity of the game and, you know, keeping recurring players and things like that and keep new mechanics rolling in to make the, the meta not as stagnant as it has been in the past couple mm-hmm. of years. I think it's also going to be important for giving like multiple ways of building a hero. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One of the main things that attracted me to Lexi back in the day when I was first really enamored with her was that there were all these different ways of building Lexi. Mm-hmm. I could like go for a really lightning heavy build or a really ice heavy build or like what ended up becoming the super meta strategy, which is just let me just throw as many arrows at your face as conceivably possible and I'll win the game. Uh, which ended up being the most competitively viable, but like it was nice to have a hero that I could have all these different builds for. Mm. that had all these different options. And with Bright Lights, I kind of feel like that's what they gave some of these heroes. There's a lot of depth now to the card pool, and so there's a lot of things that you can do to build each of these heroes, and you're seeing these really wide different lists as a result. Yeah, it's interesting to look at it in that lens where it's a kind of a, a lesson learned from the elemental heroes how mm-hmm. they're so widely overtuned because of the cards that they have access to so pouring this you know the new support with other heroes makes a lot of sense to me moving on to the next point i have complained a lot in the past few years uh, about some of the blitz heroes being only blitz because they have a title and now that we've seen cases where these blitz heroes with titles have become older versions I begin to think about, okay, if you're going to have a single class set with minimum like three heroes, like similar to with Bright Lights, they created three new ones. Is every single class set going to create three new heroes? Like, is that going to eventually cannibalize heroes from each other or against each other? Or can we see some of these adult heroes, or uh, excuse me, or can we see some of these Blitz only heroes be brought into CC? Like, are there, are there effects? that powerful that prevent them from being adult or can we see like different versions of them like that's what i would want to see yeah it's kind of odd because i never really realized why they were young only in the first place Mm -hmm. yeah i just assumed they had strong effects that they didn't want to have in cc but i couldn't tell you why exactly i feel like kasai benji ira would be like fine cc heroes i think ira might be able to be a little degenerate like being able to pitch a blue to do Kodachi and then C and C for seven is pretty strong. Yeah. But even then, it's only like two cards and, you know, however many turns a game goes. But I would also say that seeing a Ira as an adult, because she was like the first hero a lot of people engage with, would be seeing the game come full circle and seeing how, like, maybe it's not exactly the same ability because it's a simple but effective ability, but seeing how they can, like, differentiate it or improve on it i guess yeah i mean she's also just extremely important in the lore (laughs) it'd be really cool to see what she ended up doing yeah and we we've talked about it on the podcast before where we have criticized or maybe 
wondered why the lore building was so weak with Legend Story Studios when it, mm-hmm. when it compared to like Magic the Gathering, which uses every card as a storytelling piece. So maybe these single class sets have different plot lines within the the overarching set, you know? I mean, I would say Bright Lights did a lot to Mm -hmm. help the story of Metrics feel more interesting. I mean, they've essentially, they took each one of the three heroes, used them as a vehicle to present an opinion on, like, the rise of technology and the, like, rapid improvement of technology even, which kind of plays into your whole criticism Mm -hmm. of Metrics of, like, how are their tanks... (laughs) And Victorian women with, you know, big old sledgehammers. Those those can't be in the same world um, without, you know, some clash happening. Uh, yeah, it feels that way. And it feels like each one of the three heroes are defined by their take on it, right? Teklovasen is this march of progress no matter what. Mm-hmm. And it needs to keep going and go faster and go farther. While Dash is this, like, optimistic hey, this is kind of harming society, but there is like a safe and healthy way of doing it so long as we remember how to take care of everyone. And Max is like, nah, screw this. Burn it all down. Try again. That is true. I mean, I'm a bit far removed from the lore drops with uh, Bright Lights because I don't care about the set as much. Mm -hmm. But um, I definitely see how like the three-pronged way of approaching, you know, the storytelling can be really interesting when it's expanded to like, for instance, the war uh, against the Demonastery and things like that. Yeah. Uh, another thing I wanted to talk about is how they introduce, like, new mechanics. Like, they kind of um, use it as a way of, like, introducing or, like, maybe sparking the imagination of the player base. Like, I look at uh, Wax Off. Yeah, Wax Off is weird. It's like a defensive combo card, kind of. It's a really interesting new way of sort of looking at ninja. It's like a Zen state token, but it's really gated behind a lot of things needing to happen, which is probably the right way to make Zen state tokens. <laughs> well, oh, the, see, that's interesting because I don't think of it as a Zen state token card. I think of it as like defensive combo. Like if you have blocked with a wax on this turn, mm-hmm. wax off gets this incredible extra effect, which is the yeah. Zen state token. But Well, that's kind of my point because... Zen State could also bring upon a new age of ninja because, you know, when I first started playing, Tank Katsu was really strong because you have Flick Flack and which makes your other combo cards block for five. And then you have your Kadachis into like a one one cost five attack. But that's what I mean, right? Like with when I first started playing, Katsu had a very tanky game plan where you would use one blue, two Kadachis, and then like a one cost five power attack. And then the rest of your turn would be you know, using Flick Flack and blocking with your combo cards to block for four and five a lot more than is typically possible. Mm-hmm. Now with Zen State Token, like if you were to get that off, every card becomes a Fate for Seen or Sink Below. We know how powerful that is. Exactly. It, it won US Nats. Exactly. So, uh, you know, this value that you get off of comboing Wax On with Wax Off, I think could maybe spur... Uh, a new change in deck building with Katsu. Mm-hmm. And I think little nuggets like that that get dropped in the set while people are like, oh, wow, I get to play Wax On and Wax Off now, question mark. But if you look at that way where you can set up like this fatigue plan or control plan, I think that's pretty interesting and what I would look forward to uh, in these or what I would like to look forward to in these single class sets. Yeah, I love all the little seeds that LSS likes to plant in their sets. Mm -hmm. And part of it feels a little bit like there's a lot of half-baked ideas that are sitting around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I always like the potential that comes from having these cards that could see play later if the right environment comes around and if they get the right support. Right. And I even think about like Nitro Mechanoid Mm -hmm. and Soraya, you know, when they first came out, like we didn't really understand how you're going to get so many hyper drivers and you know, be able to use equipment effectively before making the Nitro. And now with the Evos, it's kind of like still its own siloed space, but a way, and now we have more ways to use Nitro Mechanoid uh, with Max Nitro. And similarly, similarly with Soraya, I feel like that whole design was thrown away when they thought of like the invocations uh, with the new prism. You know what I mean? Yeah, the figments. Yeah, exactly, with the figments, excuse me. So I 
really wanted to highlight uh, a n- new product that they released alongside uh, Brightlight's Roundtable, which is the first iteration of four-player UPF pre-cons in one product with the mat, which is pretty cool. But it introduced four, uh, three new heroes and then revisiting Ira and giving support for specifically the Crouching Tiger line, which alongside this new approachable limited set, I think is a really great way to approach new players. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about the significance of like printing more products like these alongside the you know bright lights or single set class. And one thing I really liked about these decks is they are streamlined. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. I played the Melody deck, and maybe the Melody deck especially, but mm-hmm. I really could only do one thing in that deck, mm-hmm. and that's ditter around until I deal 40 damage in one turn. <laughs> the game plan was very focused. So focused, I could literally only do one thing over the course. Like, I had one game plan. And the simplicity in that, I think, is really nice for, for newer players, you know? Mm-hmm, you're like, mm-hmm. this is what you're going to do. Sing your songs, swing... Crack a bunch of coppers, play this card. And it's very mm-hmm. easy to focus on that. I think the Brevent deck probably also had the similar thing going on. Yeah, set up, punch, set up, punch. Where if so many of your cards do the exact same thing and it's a lot more streamlined. Mm-hmm. And having a new player product where there's enough complexity in a multiplayer scene or in a game of flesh and blood itself that you can allow a newer player to get used to that complexity with a very streamlined deck. Yeah, linear deck building, but overarching complexities with multiplayer play makes it a really great product to break people into. I think they're also just like more blitz playable than the intro decks have been. Mm -hmm. Like I've seen the intro decks and people have really liked the intro decks. I've never liked them because they always felt extra underpowered. Mm -hmm. These UPF decks are optimized for multiplayer play, Mm -hmm. but I feel like I could take them to a blitz armory and still play the game. Yeah. Like, I don't feel like I would be hampered by my deck quite in the same way that I would have felt with a Blitz intro deck. Right, because my very first Blitz uh, Blitz structure deck was Bolton, and I think the only rare or one of the only rares was, like, via the Vanguard, and you get one copy, and then Minerva, which is, like, $15. Yeah. It's, like, more than the actual deck itself, right? Mm-hmm. But with these round table decks not only were there play sets of majestic cards Mm -hmm. but they're playable majestics it's not Mm -hmm. just like random chaff you know what i mean yeah i think that really helped it this is a product that a new player can buy it does one thing very well and you can take it to your blitz armory play the game and not feel completely outclassed yeah so and the reason why i bring it up is because i think Something like this sealer product, not specifically round table, like I don't know if it would be a series per se for like UPF products specifically. It is going to be. They've they've said that. They're gonna it's gonna be specifically round table more round the table and it's gonna be multiplayer. They haven't talked about like when they want to release it and how many they want to release, but they have Mm -hmm. said we really like this product, we're getting a good response, we want to do it again in the future. So whether or not it takes this form or if they experiment with another like sealed product, I think they should print more of this because of the way that New people can new players can approach it in the way that they can't always approach bright lights in the same way, and I think Fuzz is going to talk about that later. But introducing like easy to access staples that were in previously out of print sets, mm-hmm. and you know these really linear game plans that allow people to just focus on this one thing, practice it a lot, and then you know branch off from there, which I think is the best way to learn flesh and blood. So all those things make me want to see more of these, at the very least, accompanying the single class sets. Yeah, I think they do a good job of being in the single class sets too, Mm -hmm. because once again, we're constantly talking about, well, I'm a brute player. What am I supposed to do? And it's like, maybe you get a card in the expansion slot, and even if you don't, there's still this other product release coming out that is Mm -hmm. very good for enfranchised players to have. Right, because I I can count on more than one hand how many guardian players were losing their marbles because they got their first usable guardian leg piece yeah in the form of a i think it's two two block temper yeah which is insane to me but i think that was like a secret like huge upgrade to guardian with it being a upf yeah structure deck alongside a single class mechanologist 
yeah. uh, set. It, it kept people engaged in the game. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a very powerful tool. So true. With that being said, Clark, would you like to tell us which classes need the most love in the upcoming sets? Yes. So like we mentioned in our turn zero, LSS, James White, they've said, we are going to return to a single class set. We are doing it again. They enjoyed the workflow and everything. So now the question is, which class is it going to be? Who's going to get who's going to get the right to be the next single class set? So I wanted to reiterate a point you made at the beginning of Red Pitch, Joel, which was an expansion in the card pool. Mm -hmm. We have all these little niches, all these small little ideas, and we just need to give the class more depth. And as I was thinking about that, I realized kind of every class almost feels that way mm -hmm. because we, for most classes, we only really have one hero or one archetype in it. And any diversity that we actually end up getting is locked behind talents or mm -hmm. a talented hero. And so it feels like there aren't a lot of, say, I think a good example of this would be maybe Runeblade. Like we feel like there's all of these rune blades, but mm. a lot of them are elemental rune blades or like with earth cards, with shadow cards. It doesn't quite feel like there's a actually a ton in rune blade. Yeah. Like and, warrior and brute would be other really good examples. Even ninja. Yeah. Um, there's only one just warrior, only one just brute, only one just ninja. If we're talking about classic constructed, there's a little bit more variety in blitz. Yeah. And so I kind of wanted to return to that well mm -hmm. and say, okay, so if everyone's kind of on the table and we're not really thinking about talents or what's locked behind the talented heroes, which archetypes do I think need that depth? So the first class I want to pitch to you guys okay. Mm -hmm. okay. listening is warrior. I think warrior mm -hmm. is needs the most depth right you now. You convince me. <laughs> <laughs> Say more things, yeah. <laughs> so right now, the warrior class is Dorinthia. Oh yeah, and Bolton's over there. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Especially because Bolton, he's like, look at a Bolton list. What warrior cards are is he running? Maybe some equipment, mm -hmm. but like what warrior cards are in his 60? You don't mean like the light warrior stuff, right? No, just not light warrior, warrior just warrior yeah. stuff. So, not to be that guy, but there's maybe like three cards, and it it was kind of closer to before Dust Hold On. Like mm -hmm. you'd run one route, and I started running like Precision Press as an extra uh, generic blue. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but other than that, mostly not light warrior. Mostly light warrior or light cards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I think he's also trying to do something interesting because they started experimenting with like bringing attacks to warrior attack action cards to warrior. Yeah. There is a lot of room for depth in the warrior. I think it has the most limited idea right now. Like if we were to define warrior, it would be good equipment, good equipment block weapon attacks, mm -hmm. focus on reactions and the reaction step maybe. Definitely. But like, is that good enough? That's a card type. Plenty of other classes work with reaction cards. Assassins work with them. Ninjas work with them. Mm -hmm. I feel like warriors need a little bit more. And that's why I think they're a really great candidate for a single class set. Mm -hmm. I would totally agree with that. Yeah, there's a lot of nuance with... Like, they kind of sort of gave, like, on hits to Dorinthia in her hero ability. But as far as her, like, weapon attacks go, there's not really anything besides, you know, her getting a counter with two hits, right? And Bolton doesn't really have any on hits either, so maybe they experiment a little bit more. Because they have things like Shatter, for instance, which is like a pseudo on hit because it literally stops you from doing damage. But you get this cool effect then that you destroy equipment, right? Mm -hmm. Or even demi heroes that are also equipment. <laughs> oh my god, I'm not getting into this again. <laughs> <laughs> also returning to your little niche argument, I feel like there is a lot of room for niche in Warrior. Mm -hmm. Talking about niche and siloed designs. We already mentioned Axe and how Axe design is the perfect candidate for something to like be given a hero and to be expanded upon. Like if you're able to cast two warrior non-attack action cards, your next Axe attack weapon is free. Oh, wow. That'd be interesting, right? So yeah. like if you're able to keep this nice big hand to play a felling swing and a swing blood, guess what? Free Axe attack. You don't need another blue to make it work. That's just an idea, but the like, you know. No, print that hero. Let's find. 
like Axe needs a hero. Yeah. It needs more support. It needs more cards. It needs the depth to make it a thing. But also, why couldn't they do that for mauls? Mm. Spears, right? If you think about the warrior and warrior cultures from all over the world, there are tons of them. You could put these warriors all over Wraith. Mm. And give them all these different different weapons and fighter cultures and at- attitudes and atmospheres. You can help build out defense reactions or attack reactions based on what the archetype is. I feel like there's a lot of room for Warrior to grow and expand all over Wraith. And really give us that sense of full culture all over the continent. And totally. That First off, that was really inspiring. Second off, um, I think that also kind of explains why Warrior doesn't have that great of an identity now. Because with daggers and with axes, they're already exploring. Like, how else can, you know, Warriors, like, you know, expand on their play style? And, you know, they uh, James White, I think, has already confirmed that they have the next class that's getting this, you know, three yeah. class or uh, all one class set. So I'm hoping it's warrior because they already have like the silo design with one handed, like it's like one, you know, one H Mm -hmm. to indicate one handed and there's two handed, two handed, uh, there's daggers now with quicksilver Mm -hmm. dagger. There's a bunch to work with. They've they've paired things with daggers and swords. Mm -hmm. So they say your next dagger or sword attack versus your next two handed attack, your next one handed attack, your next axe attack specifically. Yeah. So like it's very easy for them to even print parallel cards and simply by changing that one word open up opportunities for these other play styles. Mm-hmm. Yeah, not only would it be the most interesting, the most needed cuz the warriors are kind of suffering right now, but it would also make the most flavor sense because they would be able to be siloed in their design uh Similar to how Bright Lights has done it. Yeah. If and you're fighting with a spear, you're not going to be fighting the same way with an axe. Mm-hmm. And yet, there are still going to be those cards that say your next weapon. Yeah. Or that's going to be huge. Or if they attacked with their weapon. Yeah. So that's that's still always going to be there as those evergreen cards that can work for everyone. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love it. I totally agree, Clark. Warriors could totally use a single class set all dedicated to itself. Yeah. Now, me and Joel were, we were tight. We were so synced up on that. I'm going to break that connection. The other class I want to pitch here, the other class I want to pitch here is Wizard. Oh, God. You had me, you lost me, Clark. A single class set of Wizards. Now, hear me out. Hear me out. Don't burn don't, it. Don't burn it before it okay. eggs. Tell me why. Wizards are already made to fight other Wizards. Okay. Oh. I, I already feel like a lot of those cards are there. Their negate abilities, all the negate cards seem to just kind of be focused on the wizard v. wizard matchup. And we, uh, what was it, in the uh, Midwinter Cube, I did an insane play where uh, I think it was, I was playing against John, uh, our uh, logistics coordinator, and he had a red blessing of ether, and that popped, and then he also, like, Popped his like metacarpus node and he used his weapon and then he threw like a giant voltaic bolt for 10 damage using his action point. And I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. Negate that shit, put that back in your hand, <laughs> fuck you. <laughs> totally got around the blessing of Aether. Yeah. It was brutal. And I think that there is a lot of room to give wizard cards that like only really work against other wizards. Wizard duels are also incredible concept. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In Flesh and Blood, it can get so degenerate though. When you're playing at instant speed, <laughs> like nobody wants to actually like cast their cards. <laughs> yeah, the first person to, you know, blow their load loses pretty much. Yeah. Dude, that just means it's gonna be so complex to play in the yeah. set. Yeah, and- I will say some really riveting like Gameplay has been isolated mirrors because what they'll do to start, you know, uh, getting energy counters on their premier chess piece in the Wizard One on One is uh, Alluvian Constellus. Mm-hmm. So they'll fire like weak spells at themselves to A B or ar- pay for Arcane Barrier mm-hmm. and get those charge counters started early, mm-hmm. so that you can, you know, use them for free whatever waning move attack. So degenerate mm-hmm. and so. F- but <laughs> yeah, it's it definitely a very skill expressed uh, he, class in general, but also yeah. matchup and seeing how more people can approach wizard in a way that you don't need 
thousands of hours, but it doesn't break the game, you know, would be interesting. And yet, in the same way, you talked about Icelander mirrors. Mm -hmm. The person who wins the Icelander mirror is typically the person doing the uh, attack-based Icelander because attack-based Icelander does really well into an Icelander with no of the attack action cards. Right, right. So, like, there's even complexity in that, right? Mm -hmm. What it, Could we print a wizard around attack action cards? That would be interesting. Maybe that's a little too room blady, but, like... Yeah, I was going to say... I think, I think that there is some complexity there. Mm -hmm. Sure. But there is a problem. There's a problem with this. Because it says wizard at the bottom of the... The Kano problem. Oh. I What's the am going to coin the Kano problem, which is that you can't print anything for wizard without going, how does Kano break this? Mm. Because he can play so many cards off the top and amplify so much damage, and that's his game plan, how do you print anything for wizard without going... Wait, can Kano just deal 70 arcane damage in a single turn by printing this? Is that fair? Can we do that? Can we print this? And I feel like that's just hampering them so much. So how do you solve the Kano problem? You just, you, you really silo your wizard designs. Mm. You create mechanics that Kano can't use, that don't let Kano use them. Maybe there is a mechanic that says this only gets a buff, if you play it on your turn. Hmm. So you can't be flipping it off the top on the opponent's turn on your big combo off. You have to do it on your turn, which then incentivizes you to not block as much so that you can return with a nice big wizard spell. Right. Because Kano basically turns every blue, theoretically, into another card off of his deck, and theoretically those would be reds, mm -hmm. right? So anything that extends damage like Aether Wildfire just makes Kano that much worse for his com combo turns. Because I think the kill floor for com uh, for Kano is like uh, like sub-30 health. It's not health. that much, yeah. I think I get what you're saying, Joel. We can't print any wizard cards that are red or blue. Yes, <laughs> yellows. Yellows, exactly. Yellow build a wizard around yellow. That'd be really interesting. Like, I, I just think, like, how do you fix the Kano problem is by siloing your wizard designs. Mm. So they kind of did that with Dynasty. Like, they had all those cards with the Surge... Yeah, with Surge. Mm -hmm. Was that what it was called? Yep. yep. Okay. <laughs> That's definitely the idea. Um, and I just think that that could really help with the Kano problem. And why I think the single set is the right type of set to release that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. With Icelander, they were like, let's just make it talented and then just print every single wizard card as Ice Wizard. And then Kano can't use any of it. Mm -hmm. He doesn't get access to all this disruption. Um and that worked. Kano didn't get a ton from that set. And they also really hindered how much Icelander could do at instant speed because she only ever could play out of her arsenal. And if it was out of hand, it'd have to be with Storm Striders. So yeah. already she has maybe a fifth of the power of Kano and still does really well. In terms of pop-off damage, yeah. And I'm talking in terms of like conversion, right? Because she has like a good amount of disruption she has good arcane damage. But yeah, I think single class set for wizard is a good idea because you can work around Kano and you can print all these new wizard cards without, and by siloing them properly, you don't need to worry about Kano quite so much. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is going to be a healthy thing for wizard. It's going to be a healthy thing for arcane damage. I think they're also going to be able to print things to like make the wizard duel matchup more interesting. I think it's a fascinating concept. It might also really, like, with the expansion slot, give more ways for other non-wizard classes to deal with wizard. Yes! The expansion slot is going to be all stuff that deals with arcane damage. It's going to be all this equipment with AB on it, yep. or spell void, like, high, maybe spell void 5. Oh, shit. Just <laughs> massive fucking spell void <laughs> number on there. Has that happened where expansion slot cards all specifically not look all at. specifically but like smashing performance yeah and in, in bright lights was specifically against items like we saw one or two and you could say you know uh the stuff drone my god just make just made her matchup into mechanologist that much better with the tool she got S specifically mechanologist with imperial flame yeah Come with like imperial flame because she can get out her big dragons a lot easier and the Chromite Dust mm. makes every matchup that has like an abundance of poppers, which Teklavasa now does. 
mm-hmm. um, a lot worse because they okay. need yeah. more poppers in hand to stop their turn. That is my argument for why wizard should be the single class set. Mm-hmm. And as a non-wizard player, I actually like that idea because... I f- number one, I feel like a lot of classes have that like dark horse that like if you print too much support, that here in particular, i.e. Alexi and Kano, get way too powerful. Yeah, somebody who is just like afraid of seeing any Kanos at all, it makes me hopeful like, okay, maybe I get more tools so that when Kano inevitably gets more power, Icelander leaves and, you know, because typically Icelander would beat Kano because she can disrupt him, throw him off his math. And A, B, a lot of his stuff so he can't combo off, right? Mm-hmm. So when Icelander is gone and the only wizard is Kano, these other wizards have to essentially deal with him and so does the rest of the field. So all that being said, I think that set could be done in a really great way mm-hmm. that makes uh, you know wizard approachable from a design space. Yeah. Do you think wizard would have a pretty big risk though? Because I know we've talked about mechanologist players, mechanologist ostracizing people who don't care about mechanologist. Mm-hmm. But because Wizard is such a different play style than everyone else, the gameplay patterns are so different that I wonder if people would feel really off-put by having a Wizard set be the only, like the focus of Limited for so long, you know? Yeah. If I go to, to Draft, I have to play Wizard Draft, which when I play Midwinter Cube, it hurts my brain <laughs> <laughs> just having Wizards around and it, the gameplay patterns are so different and you have to think so differently about how to win and how to not, not lose that I can see people getting over it pretty quickly, actually. Yeah, this is my this is my riskier one, right? I think Warrior is very safe. I think Wizard's a little bit more out there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I also want to mention one more thing during this, which is we're talking about the future releases of these single-class sets. How often are we really going to get these? Because there are nine more classes for LSS to go through. If we do one every year... We are not going to be done with this initial set of 10 classes until, let me do some quick maths here. Let's see, it's 2023 plus 9, 2032. (laughs) So it's interesting that you say one a year because we don't know how often we're going to see one of these. Could Could we deal with two of our three draftable sets released each year? Like... How many sets are they even going to release each year? I think four. they originally wanted four, yeah, but they've only really managed to do three. And they haven't talked about getting rid of supplemental sets yet, so... I thought they... They, they talked about down doing less, doing fewer of them. Downsizing them, but sure. still not getting rid of them. Mm-hmm. Could we deal with two single-class sets in a given year? <sighs> Probably not. I think one a year sounds right. I don't think it would be more frequent than that. Yeah, because if you think about it, like... Th- to make one class work, it has to be at least three heroes, right? Yeah. I can't imagine they... A two-hero draftable set sounds like a nightmare. Right. So I can't imagine that they... Or maybe they have to create new heroes every single time. So the hero pool is like tripling in size every year. Or not every year, but like adding three more every year. And, you know, six, six more years seems absurd to think about. Mm-hmm. So maybe well, it we is... didn't hear that they're going to be putting in more heroes yeah, into they... the game, yeah, per year than normal. Like the frequency of new heroes being added is going to go up, and that's why they had these pro quests this season be worth more points. Oh, mm-hmm. to gonna, get they're people to get cycling thing... faster. Yeah, they're trying to rotate heroes faster. Interesting. Mm-hmm. But you know, it's so. Let's say once a year. Fuzzy, you said that that sounds like a good rate of getting these single class sets. Joel, sure. would you agree once a year? I think once a year is safe, but if they're, yeah, I'll leave it at that. But maybe so, even less frequently, you know? Maybe even less frequently. Like every 15 even months. later than that. So then I want you guys to think what's going to happen when Brutes are slated for 2032? Oh, I'm quitting and they the just, game. And I'm... they just do nothing but complain for nine years. <laughs> when are we getting our single class set? When's the brute no, one no, coming? No, no. It's not like you only get... Mechanologist got very little support for so long. But like Rangers aren't going to be complaining about that because they just got a set in Outsiders that boosted a lot of their Ranger stuff, you know? Mm-hmm. Ninjas just got a little bit of support. Like We'll see every other classes. You're, you're not going to have one class per year get support. That's... Yeah, maybe we're focusing too much on this one set of three or of one class with three heroes, right? Like we're still gonna have regular core sets, so maybe it, it'll be fine because I'm sure 
Savage Lands is going to be a set coming up. So mm-hmm. maybe we don't have to, like if we do have to wait a long time for the all brute set, we get brute tools ahead of time. Yes. And that is something that they're going to have to do. Mm-hmm. But I think we've also seen some pockets of the flesh and blood community be a little whiny of why are they getting this fun tool and where's ours? Mm -hmm. Or you just gave us a fun tool. Why are you giving it to this other thing? Something similar. And a lot of it is centered in the brute community right now, which is why I'm using them as the example. But I could easily see this turning to other people. I mean, Azalea players were complaining for a long time that they're just printing Lexi cards, Lexi cards, Lexi cards. Azalea can't use these cards. What are you doing? And then Outsiders came out and they quieted down. But I think there is an ebb and flow to our communities of how long we can go without getting something or something that we like before we start complaining. And LSS is going to have to manage that. If they're only releasing one single class set a year, five years down the line, people are going to really start asking, well, when's my turn? Yeah. And yeah, especially if we look at it as a, at this like, huge blanket approach of like here this will be everything brutes will need for the next five years but there's still going to be like you know little snippets there's going to be like supplemental sets so hopefully it's not that dire Mm -hmm. uh but it is going to be i think a bit more of a balancing act because people are going to be now focusing around well this is when we're getting it Mm -hmm. and when is that happening and I think more of the conversation, more of the optics are going to be around when these single class sets are coming out and who they're coming out for. And I don't know if LSS wants that heat. I feel like we're a couple steps away from the expectation being like, when will I get this boon of a single class set? Because we haven't even had any until now anyway. It's not mm-hmm. like every class was expecting to have them be the spotlight for an entire set. And But now they are. And that's what this the whole sort of conversation is about. Yeah, but I don't think we're there yet, is all I'm saying. Yeah, but I, I do understand like the frustration because in the past couple of years, we've had two Rune Blades, three Illusionists, and two new Guardians, and two Brutes, or like two Warrior, you know, spread a- across like a really long time. And then Mechanologist like has only ever had one hero with very little support. So that was like a you know, a unique case, but yes. there's a lot of examples where if you're not a specific class where you get multiple heroes because of the most popular, the most powerful, then, you know, it can feel really bad to be waiting that long for your time to shine, theoretically. So I think that's all I have for Yellow Pitch. Wait, 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 wait. You're telling me you're going to go through heroes that are perfect for the next single class set and you're not even going to mention Merchant? No. <laughs> Merchant is the perfect class to have its own single class set if we go through the criteria we were looking at before, right? It's a class that hasn't had very much support in the last ever. Mechanologist players are sitting here like, we haven't had a a class for us in a while, but merchants have had two Blitz heroes (laughs) with no actual support. A single class set would be the perfect way to introduce Merchant to the game. I am here for it. I've wanted a playable no. merger for a long time. Oh, yeah. 100%. That's... You have, like, the different gold, bronze, silver, and gold tokens, which would be a great way to silo the different draft archetypes. Mm-hmm. You have two characters that could easily be thrown in and given their, perhaps with a different hero ability, because I think, Guinness, what you need is a little bit, like, multiplayer focused. Yeah. But you could have, like different versions of these heroes that work really could work really well for getting expanded on in a single class set. Yeah. I love it. And it could also introduce <clears throat> and it could also introduce like more generic weapons or generic equipment, right? Um at least- oh, hold on. If you're if you're printing merchants, why are you throwing generics in there? Yeah, I would want to see merchant weapons. Oh, I want to see merchant specific? weapons. Yeah. I mean, hey, that, that's well, cool too. Not even weapons. Yeah. You know, with some of our wizard and room blade stuff, they're not even weapons, right? Mm. There's like tomes and stuff that like you or like just a draw coin card. purse or something, or like a ledger. Yeah. <laughs> that, I'm, come on, I see you over there, but you know you love this idea. <laughs> Clark is groaning with the strength of a thousand suns. The moment that I heard Ledger as a weapon, <laughs> which I like half brought up, I was like, oh no, wait, this is kind of cool now. 
I think Ladies money. And gentlemen, we got him. <laughs> I think money would also be cool as like a full build around. Mm -hmm. I don't think I ever see like. And we could see contracts come up again. Okay, but like totally different. Yeah, <laughs> or bounties. Okay, look. <laughs> <laughs> right now, he hates how much merchant he it. is. Firmly in the meme category. Because mm -hmm. it's not supported. But they made these heroes before. And that's what like my favorite thing about Bright Lights is. Is you had a hero with the smallest card pool. Quote unquote. Mech had the smallest card pool while not being Merchant. Merchant actually does have the smallest card pool in the game. Here, here's what I'm saying. It is a Blitz only class right now. Mm -hmm. And more than that, they've really pushed it towards lower power and multiplayer formats. Mm -hmm. Even when they gave us a brand new bard hero who we've already talked about as being way more playable in the Blitz format is still super focused on CC, or sorry, on UPF and does not have a CC version. Right. I think we would like to see some of these archetypes be given their love and brought into CC and brought into like classic flesh and blood rather than proper flesh and blood i would like to use that phrase classic flesh and blood that mm. cc 40 life playing to win taking it to a tournament yeah we'd like to see that i think lss first needs to prove that they are willing to give these heroes a cc adult version and competitive archetypes before we can say hey let's give them a full single class set okay I think they first need to even demonstrate that they're willing to step into that competitive realm with these classes. Do you think it'd make more sense to do like the assassin route where we have a one of the three classes in a draftable set before yes. we see a lot of focus on it? I that, can maybe, that's what I think it would be. I can maybe be convinced well, to do with, that. Because they've also printed so much money support already in generic, right? Mm -hmm. They're already leeching away the cards that we'd like to see in this merchant class into the generic card pool. Or are they seeding the card pool with potential support for an archetype that's printed in the future? I think right now it's Schrodinger's <laughs> merchant. <laughs> All right, now that I've taken over Clark section for a bit, let's move on to mine. <laughs> yeah, 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 you, you just take it. <laughs> for Blue Pitch today, I've been thinking a lot these past couple weeks about how we were expecting Bright Lights as a single class set to be beginner friendly but it also has a lot of appeal towards enfranchised players. And that's basically, I wanna talk about that for the next 15 minutes. But I also wanna frame this discussion in the larger scheme of single class sets. I think there's a impression on the community because Bright Lights was announced at the same time as Crack Shuffle Play, that single class sets are easier and more approachable. And there's some truth to that. So in the future, when they talk about more single class sets coming out in the future, I want, people to be thinking about like, is this going to be a beginner friendly set? Is this going to be a good time to get people involved in the game? Is this a set that I as an experienced player can ignore because it's not meant for me, right? So a lot of this is going to be an open discussion with you, you two. Do you think that this set is easier for new players to engage with? Do you think this set is rewarding for enfranchised players to play with? I know that when I was playing in Sealed, I kept having this feeling like there was lots of decisions to be made, lots of things that were just took a lot of time for me as an experienced player to work out and evaluate. And I imagine a, a newer player would have a hard time with a lot of these mechanics or figuring out like the best lines of play, what's the best way to play my cards. What do you guys think? First impressions. I feel simil similarly that there's so much nuance to this set than you know everyone gave it credit for initially especially with you know when we went to pre-releases i noticed that one decision i made in the first couple turns means i got fatigued and the other person didn't fatiguing meaning you know i have no more cards left in my deck i have no more firepower and they end up winning because i have nothing to block with right mm -hmm. and i don't think that's something that newer players would necessarily understand at the same level or even get to like maybe they block really poorly and the other person blows them out i think the decisions that a newer player would make make fi the fatigue strategy or the fatigue happening at all a lot harder to get to right and i think i think that taking away these struggles of okay do i go into you know warrior as dorinthia or do i go into bravo as guardian in a welcome to wraith draft this is much easier because it's just 
You can draft any mechanologist card. It's probably going to work. I mean, mm-hmm. You maybe have more items. You and I might go dash IO if we have a critical mass of items, but maybe they just go max because they like the way he looks or tackle Boston and find out the hard way, right? So I think there's room for both. But ultimately, I think my you know long-winded answer is that this is in concept for new players, but I think it's more for the experienced players, specifically or especially when you consider these heroes are going to be evaluated on a competitive standpoint very soon as pro quest season and world's season mm. is upon us like we're like it's up to the enfranchised players to decide like who's good and who isn't and you know like, truly evaluate the strength of these heroes and impact the you know single class sets in the future sure what do you think clark i kind of want to rephrase something that you said there mm-hmm. in my own words and in my feelings which is I think they have lowered the barrier of entry for new players. For sure. You spend less money to go to seal to do a sealed thing. You're spending less money to do crack shuffle play. It's easier to get started with a pool of cards, so you need to buy less product to get there. But when you do sealed, when you do draft, these limited formats are really where most new players engage first engage with the game. To be able to build a good deck, it is a lot harder. In previous sets, you were always able to pick your first card and look at the bottom and go, oh, this says Runeblade, and then just pick every single Runeblade card out of every single pack that now Mm -hmm. passes you. Yep. That was an easy... And whenever you didn't have a Runeblade card, pick a generic. And it made deck construction a little bit easier. Now, you have to make a decision Mm. because you can draft everything. So it creates more decision points, and for certain new players, that's going to be harder on them. Yeah. You did bring up something great, which was new players can just throw together a pile and it's functional Mm. because nothing is worse than cracked bobble. Yeah. Yeah. If a new player goes, oh, wait, I didn't do a good job, and actually two other people ended up in my archetype, something that can totally happen in Flesh and Blood Draft. Mm -hmm. So now I need four cracked bobbles. Wait, I'm like not even close to having a blitz deck that I could play. Why'd I even do this? Yeah. That is true that in this set in particular, having crack shuffle play does almost kind of give you a blitz deck. It's not good and you can make improvements really quickly with it, but that's a 40 cards and a hero. Yeah. Even the proto bases are something that you can conceivably run. Like you're not happy about it. You'd rather run like other stuff, but you can certainly get away with it Mm -hmm. in a blitz deck. And so it's so much easier and faster to build that, get to the point where you have a playable deck for the format. But I also just think Flesh and Blood is at the point where, like, look, so many of us are enfranchised players who are already in the TCG space. We're spending money and we're building decks right from the Mm get-go. A new player throwing a 40-card pile together is still never going to be able to compete at an armory. Mm -hmm. Ever. 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 Just because the vast majority of other players have a much higher power level already. And in Magic, that wasn't the case. I was able to, like, get a pile of red-white humans and with, like, maybe $10 of buying singles have something I could bring to a Friday Night Magic and compete with some of the top decks. That was doable in Magic the Gathering. I think it's not as doable here in Flesh and Blood. Yeah, I I do agree with you, Uh, and I think that is in large part due to Magic have a much larger uh, database of cards, Mm -hmm. so you can kind of like head towards a specific strategy, and you know if you bring enough cheap cards that attack that specific thing, you could definitely win. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, not not discounting your point at all, but um, that's definitely harder to do in Flesh and Blood because you just have. The top decks, the best heroes, right? Usually at armories, because it's a good mix of like new players getting into the game and your seasoned players like grinding XP for larger events with this these top tier decks, right? It all depends on where you're at, but you know that's kind of what you're going to be looking at. Um, but this, you know, uh, unique way of letting someone just buy three packs and you have essentially a blitz deck is way more approachable than like. You know, the, the Blitz deck heroes, because those are, I mean, not more approachable, but it's on the same level, right? But mm-hmm. it's an interesting marketing technique. 
I will say I actually really liked Crack Shuffle Play as a teaching tool. Mm -hmm. uh, I've only played one game of it just mm -hmm. now before we recorded the podcast. But even like it was just me playing against Clark. We opened three packs, shuffled them together, and played. And the types of lines that you would see in Crack Shuffle Play are very different than the type of lines that you would see even in Sealed, where you do a little bit of optimization in your deck in Sealed. In Crack Shuffle Play, you just have a bunch of hands and you got to see what you can do with them, right? Mm -hmm. You learn halfway through the game what your game plan to win even is. Like I realized at the very end, oh, I actually can only win if I play this card that has... Evasion. A, if I play this heavy artillery that can only be blocked by expensive attack action cards. And I needed that to connect in order to win. And it worked out. But being able to recognize... In, like improv a bunch of different scenarios, I think they can be really good for teaching newer players how to play. Hell, we know how to play. <laughs> we don't need the help, but we still ended up talking amongst ourselves about different lines of play across that one on both sides of the table. I was surprised by the value that had in understanding the game. And I think that could be a really good way to teach new newer players how to play more so than grabbing a couple intro decks. And it's about the same price, right? Intro decks are like what, 10, $15? Yeah, I think MSRP is about fifteen bucks, and then like you know MSRP for like three packs is probably twelve dollars or something like that. So there's on a similar pay scale, but and you I, get a sim amount, similar amount of rares and majestics, etc. You might even get more. Yeah, if you get lucky, you know. And I think you know opening packs and seeing what you get is also a really big part of what drew me to Flesh and Blood. Mm -hmm. I just like opening packs, man, and you know finding the shiny stuff. Like when I first opened like you know a box of Vulcan Wraith and a box of I think. Monarch, I pulled a legendary in each one and I was like hooked for life and I'm still here today because I mm -hmm. like opening the packs. You know, the, the blitz decks are a good tool, but I think those maybe not phased out, but they could be definitely be supplemented by this crack shuffle play and just getting three packs. Like that's, that's really strong marketing, right? And imagine being that, that newer player that just opened up three mechanologist packs, but you also get a surprise card in there. What's this? Some tome? Something for Draconic Heroes? What's a Draconic Hero? Yeah, yeah. Like, it can inspire you to look at other heroes as well. When you have, like, another card in the set that could be for, like, any other hero in the game, mm -hmm. it can be a gateway, a little bit of inspiration for a newer player to explore other heroes. Like, Talon mentioned, like, he opened up some booster packs of Everfest when he first started playing, and for that reason, he really wanted to play Guinness What You Need, the merchant, because he found a copy of the merchant hero. He was like, who's this guy? <laughs> I'm like, unfortunately, you can't really build a deck around him right now, but it's that sort of thing where you open booster packs to just decide what your hero is going to be that I think a lot of newer players do that we forget about. Absolutely, yeah. And I don't think I would have chosen Bolton if he wasn't the only Blitz deck left at like the <laughs> store I went to, right? Uh, because I was like, I don't really know much else about the game. I'm just going to take this somewhere and see what I can do with it, right? Wow, and then it became a whole part of your flesh and blood identity. Uh, my DNA's shifted, for sure. Yeah. To, <laughs> yeah, to make room for, for it, Bolton. Man, it's crazy how that works, right? And so the expansion slot's so cool because... Yeah, they're getting started with all mechanologists. So obviously they have all these mechanologist options, four of them, if you think about it, with mm. Dash with a Dash uh, sure. Inventor. But then they also, if they get to pull an expansion card, all of a sudden there's a whole other option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it it really I I love that you put it that way. It's uh it's an inspiration point. Yeah, because think yeah, of all, it inspires you. <laughs> think of all the sick art that's on the majestics that would normally be in the in the expansion slot. Like they're all really cool. Any of one of those could you know get you in for life on that specific hero. Yeah, but it's also really nice for enfranchised players too. You know, mm -hmm. I think we get into this this idea of like the expansion slot is for the people who are already playing the game, and I still probably agree with that more than even the point we just brought up. But the idea of this expansion slot a way for all players who are already playing to have a little piece of something that they can put into their deck and improve their hero a little bit, give them a couple more options. Yeah, I definitely really enjoyed, you know, pulling random Majestic so that, that I could either, you know, flip and pay for my pack or my entry mm -hmm. or use for my other deck. Like, oh, I don't have to, you know, buy this $15 single now. Or even money. I mean, I was playing against somebody who was like, yeah, I just started getting into the game. Uh, our LGS gave us free blitz packs we i've been playing it with my college buddies with my dorm mates 
And now I'm here. And I was like, cool, like what's in your pool? I was talking about some of the deck building decisions with them. And then they showed me a foil uh, Tome of Imperial Flame. And I'm like, hey, I think that's hey. worth some money. Yeah. That could fund them building the deck. Yeah. So mm -hmm. even if they're like, no, I want to do Teklavasan or Dash IO, still getting that nice expensive ex uh, expansion slot card, they could trade that, that mm -hmm. to get a bunch of bolt. Mm -hmm. That is... I could definitely see that happening. Because I'm certainly going to, you know, sell all the good stuff I pull to fuel mm -hmm. my other purchases. That That's a really good point. Yeah. And I think that's something that LGS is even encouraged during this set. Like, I think because we had this conversation leading up to Bright Lights about this being four new players, I noticed that a lot of LGSs actually changed their price structure a little bit to be rewarding to people who didn't win a lot and say everyone gets five packs regardless of the amount of wins that they get. Mm -hmm. I was at that pre-release and I went 4-0. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that felt a little bad, but I guarantee that every single person who that is their first ever flesh and blood event, mm -hmm. they just learned how to play the game, loved getting all the extra cards to help put together something that's actually decent yeah. for an armory night. Yeah, totally sweet feeling. I think that's about all I wanted to say. Um, do you guys want to move into our arsenal zone? I would love to. So our arsenal zone is where we take a little bit of time to talk about a card that we either like or a card that we absolutely can't <laughs> fathom that it exists or just something we were thinking about today. Clark, would you like to start us off? Shit, 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 <laughs> shit, shit, <laughs> shit, fuck. I didn't look up a card. Uh, I, uh, uh, <laughs> I have one if you want to send it. No, 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 no. This is fine. This is fine. This will work. This will work. Um, we're keeping this in. Um, yes, we are. <laughs> uh, wizard. I talked about wizard today. I'll do a wizard card. Um, well, I'm going to go grab my Sharpie. No! <laughs> <laughs> my Sharpie. I found a card. I picked it. I I got the card. I got the card. I got the card. I can grab it now or I can grab it later. <laughs> My card is Aetherize because that was the thing that I used in that play against John. It's a it's a negate card. It's really really cool. I love that they're printing these cards for Wizard with negate. Uh, this specifically says negate target instant card with cost one or less. And that's my arsenal card. Well said, Clark. <laughs> <laughs> For my card today, <laughs> I want to talk about a lady, a lovely lady that was there to support me during pre-release. Okay. <laughs> Her name's Big Bertha. Big, Big, Big Bertha. <laughs> Big Bertha. <laughs> I realized halfway through pre-release weekend, Big Bertha is amazing. Three for six boost is not necessarily a good rate. But you don't want to banish a card off the top for this necessarily. No, no, no. You just want to play that three for six and get value because this is a fatigue format. You pitch three to a swing for six, you only lose one card out of your deck. They have to block two or else they take damage. And since no one takes damage in this format, they're just going to have two fewer cards in their deck. And you are going to get closer to having a bigger pile at the end. Go Big Bertha. You do your thing. I also won a game because at the very end, I had a hyperdriver out that I needed to have out for some reason, in order to get Dominate on my bull bar. <laughs> and I boosted with the bull bar and flipped a Big Bertha. <laughs> oh, baby. And Big Bertha puts a counter on your hyperdriver when you boost it away. So I got to keep my hyperdriver out to hold the overpower. And I remember thinking, wow, I was not playing around that very well. I was about to throw this game. <laughs> <laughs> but instead, I flipped at Big Bertha, so I didn't have to throw the game. There were a million ways I could have not lost, and that happened to be one of them. <laughs> so Big Bertha, even though I wasn't thinking, you were there for me, and I was able to go 4-0 at Kingslayer pre-release and get me some cold foil proto bases. Let's go. So I have a copy for each of you. I'm going to sign it. One for you and one for you. Thank, Thank you. you, Fuzzy. All right, Joel, what do you got? All right, so my card is actually two cards because I was wildly disappointed with not their performance, their smashing performance. I'm just kidding, I hate that joke. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it is smashing performance and arc smash. Oh, wow. Because I think they don't really have the same power level this set as I thought they originally would. Yeah. Because Dash IO I don't think is really gonna replace OG Dash all that much. And you know, Arc Smash 
I may just need to destroy one, maybe two items, but I'm just not going to be, you know, getting the full value out of it. Same with Smashing Performance. The fact, that, the fact that it's on a draw and discard and it's random on what I hit and it doesn't have go again. Like, I would be okay with giving up the tempo if I thought items were going to be a bigger problem, but Tekelvasen seems to be the strongest mech of them all. I don't even think he's going to be all that powerful. He doesn't use items. Max Velocity or uh, Max Nitro doesn't seem that strong either. So, anyways, I was thinking about these two cards and it was just like, man, it's actually not that good because the mechs aren't that good. But we'll see. Hopefully I get to use them. But yeah. that's my shout out for today. I feel like it's more like you want to run like one arg smash mm -hmm. and you're like, oh, I'm going to get great value off of this one arg smash because I have the sideboard tech. But now it feels like you need three so that you can get it fairly reliably yeah. around the time that they have the item that they want to stick around on the field. Exactly. Yeah. And like when we, when it seems like all these items with crank are like leaving the field really quickly, mm -hmm. we just aren't going to really be getting that value. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it feels like I'm going to miss it entirely, you know, play it on a turn where they don't have one. And then they maybe instant speed out one immediately after I whiff or, you know, pass or whatever. So, mm -hmm. yeah, feels like a miss to me. I don't know. It feels like it could be playable still. It's there if Dash ever gets really strong. Mm -hmm. I will be ready <laughs> in the shadows, quite yeah. literally. Well, thanks for potting with me, boys. Thank you, listener, for tuning in. I think we did it. I don't think we mentioned Levia. God <laughs> damn it! <laughs> Bro. Oh, bro. <laughs> and it was you. <laughs> it wasn't even us. I, I did so good. No, that doesn't count. Yeah. No, yeah. that counts. That absolutely counts. No. You really did. We did not mention that. Pitch It To Me podcast is hosted by Fuzzy Delp, Clark Moore, and Joel Racinos. Executive producer, Talon Stradley. Logistics coordinator, John Farkas. Music by Dylan Hulse. Logo by Han V. Sound mixing, Christopher Moore. And last but not least, you. Thank you for listening. Please give us a follow on your favorite social media platform at Pitch It To Me Podcast. Stay tuned for some outtakes. I'm going to start with, I think it's far enough Clark, away. Clark, there's a plane. <laughs> Clark. I think it's far enough away. I mean, you can't run a bunch of chivalries because that's the whole hero power of um, Brent. It's not okay. Brent. <laughs> Brent. Oh, it's like Brevent or something? Yeah, it's Brevent. Yeah, but just, <laughs> could you imagine? <laughs> and this is Brent. <laughs> it is Brent. He looks yeah. like a Brent. <laughs> Okay, so maybe I posed the wrong question <laughs> to the wrong group, but my, my... This is the right group? <laughs> <laughs>